Welcome everyone. This is the fifth presentation in my conference series and this one takes us back to 2014 to European Transport Conference which was held in Frankfurt, Germany. So the title of this paper and for this video is Upgrading Rural Bridges for Improved Freight Efficiency. So today's presentation is in the context of Queensland, Australia and Queensland has is a very large state with a fairly low population which is located mostly at the southern the southern part of Queensland or the southern actually southeast Queensland and then most of the rest of the state there's not too many people and they're rather scattered but still we need to have roads to connect these um, smaller towns and all and these roads generally have fairly low volumes and in a typical cost-benefit analysis you'll find that your benefits are quite strongly related to the volume of the road as you see, can see from the graph here, benefits for low volumes are actually fairly low. And generally you have also a linear relationship between benefits and traffic volumes up until the point we start to get congestion, where the volume capacity ratio of around 1. And after that, roads become highly congested. And then we're assuming that the project that's proposed resolves this congestion issue. And if it does, then you should have very, very high benefits from that project. But today we're going to be looking at bridges, and bridges are just a little bit different in the sense that it's an access issue, and that's particularly true for freight. And many of the bridges in rural Queensland are reasonably old, and they weren't designed for some of the very large freight vehicles we have today. Some of the vehicles we were talking about are very large, like you have your road trains and all that. You're talking about three or four carriages and long, they're very long, they're very heavy. And these roads didn't cater for that. So alternatively, these vehicles will have to take reasonably long diversion routes to actually reach their destination, and that can also be quite time-consuming and can be very costly. Also, as well, some of these bridges are fairly low-lying and they tend to flood. So again, flooding, if the you know, road closes for a period of time, is going to cause vehicles not to travel or take alternative routes, which again can be fairly costly. So let's now take a look at additional factors that need to be considered when we're looking at road uh, bridge upgrades. So the first one has to be the load limits. What is the load limit on the bridge? And what are the type of vehicles typically going to use that bridge? So the load limit could be because the bridge wasn't designed for those heavy type of vehicles. Or it could be because the bridge is very old. It's been there a long time and it's not in a very good condition. So load limits have to be placed on that bridge to prevent it from falling down. Another thing to look at as well is the level of flood immunity. How often does this bridge flood? How often does this road flood? And again, does it how does this frequency of floods cause a significant disruption? Are they for very long? If they're long floods, maybe you can't travel or freight gets delayed and stuff like that. And also you've got to consider as well, if a road is flooded or a bridge is closed because of flooding, what, what alternatives does the user have? Can they wait? Maybe if it's not too long. Is there an alternative route? That's probably critical, especially if site has to be has to reach a certain destination within a certain time. An alternative route might be critical. If that's not available and it's a long delay, then that's going to be very costly, particularly for perishable goods that can't have those delays because they will they will go off before they reach their destination. So potentially can be very very costly for those um, um, goods. The main focus of today's paper is going to be on load restrictions on bridges. So what happens when a bridge has got a load restriction on it? For example, you've got to get a, a truck that's 50 tons over that bridge. And the bridge has got a load restriction of, let's say, 30 or 40 tons. First off, the truck can't go straight over, obviously. So what? So we've got approach A. So what the um, the road user can do is actually take an alternative route in order to avoid the bridge. And depending, is there an alternative route? Sometimes there isn't, and that alternative route could be exceedingly long. Another approach is to actually use smaller vehicles. So instead of using one 50-ton vehicle, we'd use two 25-ton vehicles, for example, to get over the 40-ton um, limit. Again, that can be problematic depending on the distances that are required to travel. Another way of doing that is to decouple. So for example, a vehicle that's got several trailers can decouple and take off a trailer and can go over and then come back and collect the other trailer and bring that one over. And then you can reconnect everything and travel on their way again. So really what it comes down to is costs. 
Is it going to be more costly to divert using an alternative route with the heavier, larger vehicle? Or is it going to be more costly to use smaller vehicles? So generally, we go with the least cost solution. And it's also possible that it could be a combination of the two. Some of the time you use smaller vehicles, and some of the time you divert. And again, that's going to most likely depend on the origin and destination of um, these trips. So first, I'm going to explain approach A, which is diverting to avoid the bridge. So, this, so we have a base case scenario where the bridge has got load restrictions and the vehicle cannot cross it. So therefore, the operator has decided to take an alternative route, a diversion route. So the costs of taking this diversion route would be you take the road user cost per kilometer and you multiply it by the section length. If the bridge is upgraded, then your cost would then be the road user cost of using the existing route plus the upgraded bridge, basically your preferred route initially, multiplied by the section length. So then you subtract this value from the value of the cost of diverting. You multiply that by the number of heavy vehicles and also by the number of days in the year. So we've got 365 days. That's assuming that freight travels on all days. Again, that number could be lower than that if we're not including weekends. I think and probably all days. It takes us down to about 250, 260 days. So again, it, it depends on the nature of the freight. But for this equation, we're going to keep it at 365 days. Approach B is to use smaller vehicles. So again, we've got another equation here. So what do we do here? So basically, we've assumed that there's opportunity to decouple. So we're looking at here, I think we've got a, a type 1 road train. So the type 1 tra road train would decouple. We take off one of the um, trailers. We travel across the bridge, then come back again and collect the other trailer, and then go back across the bridge again. So not exceeding the weight limits. But you need to have the two decoupling points and the distance between those two decoupling points factors in that. So the prime mover has to make one, two, three trips. And then each, so the prime mover on its own makes one trip, I apologize. And then the prime mover attached to the, um, the single trailer would make two trips. Whereas in the, um, in the project case, you just require one trip without any decoupling. So then we've got to look at the costs of transporting, of doing um, two trips with the, um, the single trailer and the one trip with the prime mover compared to the cost of just doing the one trip with the um, type 1 road train and then you compare the difference of that and then multiply the section length or the distance between the two decoupling points and then we multiply that again by the number of vehicles that are required to do that and also by the number of days in a year and that should give us the cost of using approach B and using the smaller vehicles. Approach C is a combination of both approach A and approach B. So then it comes down to, I guess, deciding when, when you should divert and also when you should actually use smaller trailers. So that's going to probably depend on the type of freight being moved and also the origin and destination. So it'd be looking at a least cost solution in this one. So if um, the two, we compare the two equations. So the lower of the two equations, the lower costs in the two equations, or shall I say the higher benefits of the upgrade, you then actually select that as your approach depending on your origin and destination. So that could change around. So like we have here in the um, diagram, you're going from A to D, or you could also be going from A to C, for example. So traveling from A to D, it appears that the uh, lower cost solution would actually be to use a diverting route from A to D. So you take the red route, so you divert from X, you go to Y, and then you carry on to D. Whereas if the origin is A and the destination is C, diverting would involve taking X to Y and then going back to C. Therefore, actually decoupling and going from your two decoupling pads on the two little blue areas there is probably going to be the lower cost solution. Again, it's, it's working out the costs and which is more feasible. And like I said, that's going to depend on the origin and destination at the time. So now I'm going to make a comparison of the three approaches, the strengths and weaknesses of them. So let's start off with approach A. Approach A is looking at diversion routes. So with diversion routes, data is generally available 
in the sense that we know that we have the data, the, the section lengths, the road widths, the traffic volumes and all for the existing route. And most, most of the diversion routes will have that data as well. Again, it is a bit of data intensive. It involves a lot of data, but that data should be available. It's applicable to most projects as well, in the sense that even though Queensland has a very vast, that's a very large area, and there's not too many alternatives, there's usually at least one other alternative. There's some remote areas where we don't have that alternative diversion route, but that is generally not the case. Also, there are the tools as well supporting this approach to analysis too, that can actually calculate benefits again based on vehicle type, based on uh, distance traveled, based on the nature of the road, whether it's sealed or unsealed, and the length of the road. Where this approach is lacking though is we're not looking at road user behavior. We've made the assumption that if the vehicle is too heavy to cross the bridge, the operator is going to decide to take a diversion. It's going to use an alternative route, even if that alternative route may be very, very long. And even if you know, the operator actually does have access to smaller vehicles. We're not factoring in any of that. Also as well, the complexity of the diversion route. Because a lot of this is, we're looking forward now, possibly five, 10 years from now, if, for example, we got a bridge that is going to become structurally unsound and we'll have load restrictions based on it then. We may not know what the future behavior is gonna be of the operators on what route they're gonna take. The route that we think they might take, they might not be able to because there may be certain alignment issues and things like that that means that those heavy vehicles can't actually use that route. And may, that may not necessarily get picked up. So let's took, look at approach B now, uh, using smaller vehicles. This is actually a fairly simple approach because we're just basically looking at the cost of different vehicles traveling, which could be quite a short distance if we're going between decoupling packs. Or it could be a longer distance if there's no decoupling and they're going from town to town. So this is fairly simple. It's good for rapid analysis because it's not data intensive. You don't need to collect data for the whole length of the road. You don't need to look for data for um, alternative routes. So again, you can get that data very quickly and do the analysis very fast. But what is, uh, what's the key weakness with this approach is, though, that not many factors are actually considered. And also, how realistic is it that all operators can actually switch to smaller vehicles and all. And also as well, we you need to have the origin destination data, which can be a little difficult and and substantially you could be blowing the benefits out of your project far greater than what they should be if we have a very, very large cost of actually using smaller vehicles for very long distances in your um, in your base case. So when in reality a diversion is probably far more likely. Let's now take a look at approach C, and this is probably the preferred approach because we're comparing approach A and approach B, and we're looking at the least cost solution. So we're looking at the optimal solution here. So this is very, very good if we're doing a detailed analysis. And again, it should be applicable to almost all projects where they have diversion routes. You'll, it could possibly take that. If there's no diversion route at all, then freight is going to be forced onto smaller vehicles. It also looks at road user behavior. So that's why I mentioned just now is you're actually looking at the lowest cost solution. And also, even if they don't take that, you're actually looking at various options that can be done and also opens up to more sensitivity testing too. So what's the problem with approach C? So you can see uh, approach A was data intensive. Approach C is even more data intensive because you need all of the data for approach A plus all the data from approach B as well. And the methodology can be quite complex because we're comparing the costs between two different options and we're looking at a particular turning point to when potentially operators will switch to, switch to smaller vehicles or potentially actually go to the larger vehicles and actually use the alternative route. So it's actually determining the timing of when that will happen and also the number of vehicles that are actually going to divert and the number that use smaller vehicles. So it can be quite tricky. And as I mentioned earlier as well, you, you need to know the origin and destination data because that's going to be origin destination of trips because that's going to be critical because if the trip is very, very far and you're going to have to use smaller vehicles for a long period of time, then the diversion route is probably going to look better. But if the distance is fairly short and you can switch to smaller vehicles and you don't have to travel too far, whereas the diversion route requires going a very long way and then going back on yourself, then 
then it's going to be it's going to definitely favor the um, switching to smaller vehicles so again looking at all three approaches they all have their strengths and weaknesses and a lot of it comes down to the amount of time that we have to do the analysis and also the amount of money available to do the analysis as well to demonstrate approaches A and B I've got a number of case studies we're going to take a look at so the first case study is the Jingy Jingy Bridge upgrade which is located along the Warragar Highway so this is going to demonstrate approach A where we've looked at a diversion route so this project is located between Warra and Chinchilla which is just west of Toowoomba the capital cost of this project was 26.3 million the life of the bridge, the new bridge, would be 40 years. Restrictions that will be placed on the old bridge will be in around 10 to 15 years' time. And the estimated number of heavy vehicles in 2028 is 470. The diversion route is 110 kilometers. And the existing route, the original route at the moment, is 82 kilometers. So here we have a map of the uh, Warragar Highway between um, Chinchilla and Dolby. So you can see here for the base case, an alternative route is required, and that's going to be 110 kilometers. In order to get the cost of traveling along this alternative route, you have to multiply the 110 by the, uh, the unit cost per vehicle. So that would incorporate the, uh, the vehicle operating cost per kilometer and also the travel time cost as well. So again, looking at project uh, the project case, you only have to travel 82 kilometers, and that's going to be multiplied by the cost, the unit costs for traveling along the uh, Warragar Highway. We'd assume as well the Warragar Highway is a better quality road than the diversion route, so you'll probably have a lower unit cost. So the vehicle might be able to travel faster, so less travel time, and if it's a better service, then you're going to have less costs, uh, road, uh, sorry, your less vehicle operating costs. So here we have the results of the cost-benefit analysis of the Jingy Jingy Bridge upgrade. As you can see, the majority of the benefits are actually coming from vehicle operating cost savings, because heavy vehicles are very expensive to operate. So a reduction in kilometers traveled is going to bring about quite substantial vehicle operating cost savings. Travel time savings, as we're traveling a shorter distance, we'd be able to travel faster. We've also got accident cost savings. That, again, would relate also to the shorter distance and also the standard of the road. The Warrego Highway would be to a higher safety standard than that of the alternative, the diverting route. So again, we'd have some accident savings. We also got environmental cost savings. They're reasonably high for this project, and that's because they're linked in with the vehicle operating cost savings and fuel consumption. So that additional fuel consumed by traveling further produces, would be true to produce quite a significant amount of emissions, and that would actually be fairly expensive in regards to things. So it gives us total benefits of about 150 million. The capital costs though were fairly low in uh, by comparison anyway of about 23.5 million dollars. Plus we got actual some reductions in maintenance costs. By again having a new bridge will require less maintenance than, than the existing bridge. We also got a residual value. So the um, analysis was um, we used was for 30 years whereas um, the life of the bridge was 40 years. So we've got an additional 10 years of life, which we put a value on. So that gives us total costs of around 19.4 million, and therefore gives us a net present value of 130.7 million, and a benefit cost ratio of 7.74. So you can see that is actually very high. So that actually relates to, even though there's not many vehicles using that road, but there's enough heavy vehicles required to travel those extra Oh, what are you talking about? 30, 30 kilometers, I think it's 470 vehicles in 2028 when, um, when the actual restrictions take place to be, have a significant cost and therefore produce a high BCR, which is not typical for, your, for a rural road that normally has a very low BCR, especially if we're looking at just the traffic volumes. But in the case of this, because of that diversion and that extra distance required to travel, means there's quite substantially higher costs in the base case, therefore producing this much higher benefit cost ratio. So let's just have a quick look at the percentage breakdown of benefits. As I mentioned um, just now, a vehicle operating costs makes up the majority of benefits at 56%, and then that's followed by travel time costs, which is 25%. And externalities are actually higher 
then your accent costs, because again, because of what I mentioned about the relationship between fuel consumption and emissions. And then the lowest is actually your accent costs. So again, I, I think the, the standard of safety in all of them, the roads would have been fairly similar. So again, you're just looking at it in terms of vehicle kilometer uh, travel and safety. So therefore, it's fairly low. We're now going to take a look at an example of how approach B has been applied. And that takes us to the Regional Bridge Renewal Program, where a rapid CBA was conducted for 65 bridges and 32 culverts. And this was actually a very rapid analysis that was done very quickly. And again, with very, very limited um, data. So it was, it was restricted in terms of what we could do within the time limit. So therefore, Approach B has come in, and it's, it's very useful for this sort of rapid analysis. So the project we're going to take a look at out of this um, program is the um, Banana Creek Bridge Upgrade. Let's now take a look at the Banana Creek Bridge Upgrade. So this was a fairly small capital cost project, cost about 3.6 million, which is actually, I comparison, actually a very low cost to many of the other projects. So again, it wouldn't make an awful lot of sense to go into a very detailed cost-benefit analysis methodology. So approach B on that basis is fairly appropriate, and also based on the time constraints as well of actually producing cost-benefit analysis for all of these projects within the program within a short period of time. But let's just take a look at this project. So with the base case, we've assumed 225 heavy vehicles, 50% articulated, so that's a prime mover with a trailer, 25% V-doubles, so that again is a prime mover with a trailer and a smaller trailer, and 25% Type 1 road train, so that's two trailers, two fairly large trailers. So the larger trucks we're assuming can cross the bridge because they're not up to load restrictions. They're probably transporting some fairly uh, light goods and stuff to get across that bridge. So in the project case, we're assuming now the bridge is upgraded, and actually there's no longer any load restrictions. Now we've assumed that the number of vehicles are now only 194. So if we look at the original 225, so only 20.5% of those are actually articulated vehicles. 33% would be doubles, and 33% are now road trains. These again are very broad assumptions that were fairly generic across most of the projects. We've got a heavy uh, vehicle growth rate of 4% annually, and a section length of just 6 kilometers. So that's on the assumption that they're only traveling 6 kilometers in total, so there's either some sort of decoupling pad or origin destinations that you seem to be very close. So here we have the location of the bridge. As you can see, it's actually um, south, um, I'm not sure exactly how far from here, but south of the um, little town of uh, Banana. So this is Banana Creek Bridge. At the time of the evaluation, interesting enough, we didn't actually have the exact location. So we're actually using very, very broad, very, very generic assumptions that we're actually putting into our model. So again, the preciseness of this analysis is not going to be particularly great, but given the time constraints at the time and also the, the cost of the project, it was deemed fairly necessary. Let's now take a look at the results for the Banana Creek upgrade. So you've got the capital cost of 3.6 million. There are some significant reductions in maintenance because now we've got a, a newer bridge than what we had before, so it doesn't need all the maintenance that the older bridge needed anyway to keep together. So you've got quite a bit of savings there, of almost a million. And then we've got the benefits of about 3.4 million. So that is actually lower than the capital cost, but because you've got the savings, the cost savings, you actually still got a positive net present value. And that came in at about half a million. And also that gives us a benefit cost ratio of 1.21. So actually, it actually still gets up. So the benefits are fairly small because of those low capital costs it's got a reasonably good benefit cost ratio. So now we'll just take a quick look at the results of the whole program. So the total capital cost of the program at 4% came in at about 190 million. So you add up all those small bridges, it comes to quite, quite a hefty capital figure. And benefits of about 211 million. So the benefits outweigh the costs here. So that gives us a net present value of about 21.2 million. And the benefit cost ratio for the whole program was about 1.11. So it's, it's reasonably low, but at least the benefits are outweighing the cost for the program. And you look at it in terms of net present value, 21.2 million is reasonably high. So again, that's all the projects included. There's a possibility some of them could be removed potentially, but 
as a program as a whole, it looks like it's reasonably good. And again, you, you've got that VCR above one and your net present value is greater than zero. So as a program, it's actually economically viable. So in conclusion, people generally, economists, analysts generally look at traffic volumes as a guide to the economic viability of a project. And in most cases, that's true. If you're adding lanes and stuff, if you're adding lanes, you know, going from two to four lanes on a country road that's not got many vehicles, you're not adding much value because you're not really solving the problem because the problem isn't really there. Even if you're adding shoulders and stuff and safety benefits and all, you're not really adding capacity. The number of vehicles is fairly low, and most of the time the benefit cost ratio is going to end up below one. When we look at bridges, they are a little bit of an exception in the sense that if it, you've got your freight that needs to get from A to B and it needs to cross those bridges, and because of the, um, the nature of the rural Queensland road network, if they can't cross a particular bridge, there's a high chance it's going to be a very long diversion route in order to do so. And then there's a sufficient number of freight vehicles using those rural routes to actually generate sufficient benefits by traveling those extra distances to produce benefits that actually exceed your costs. So I think that wraps it up for today. Um, thank you um, for listening to this presentation. And I'll be uploading some more soon. If you like today's video presentation, just click the like button and the subscribe button and I'll be uploading several more videos in the weeks to come. Again, within the same series, videos relating to the um, transport conferences, as well as several other videos also relating to economics. If you want to find out more about today's paper, just go to my website at spectrumecons.com and you go to the research paper, just click the link there and you'll get the paper in full. Again, thank you for listening. Goodbye.